Welcome, everyone. In this session, we are talking about pod power, an exciting new feature that will most likely go alpha in 132, which will help uh, simplify the Kubernetes resource management as we are trying to move the resource management from the container level to the pod level. Um, my name is Dikshita, and I work for Google, and I'm an active contributor to Signode community. And with me is my friend. Hello, my name is Peter. Um, I am uh, a senior software engineer at Red Hat. I am a cryo maintainer and a Signode chair. And I'm excited to be here and talking with you all. So thank you for joining. Um, so today, we're going to be talk of, talking about one of the foundational aspects of multi-tenancy in Kubernetes, requests and limits. Um, and I presume the majority of people are familiar, but I'm going to go over for those of us that may be new here. Um, a request is a way uh, for a pod to specify um, to the Kubernetes uh, system, I would like to have at least this much of a resource. Today, the resources we're going to be talking about are CPU and memory. There are other ones you can request, but those aren't relevant here. And then a limit is saying, I'm prepared to be punished if I use more than this amount. I say this in this particular way, and I'll explain a little bit later, because you're not always punished if you use more than it. Sometimes you can be. So the way specifically that this works for uh, memory, because they work a little bit different between CPU and memory, a memory request is used by the scheduler, basically saying, like, so when the pod is created, you know, the API server will give that to the scheduler, and the scheduler will be like, ah, I need to find a node with this much memory available. The CRI does not use uh, memory that's requested. Uh, there is a memory QoS cap, which will change this, but that's in at this perma alpha state because uh, it's, there are some other issues with it. So we're not doing that right now. A memory limit, on the other hand, scheduler doesn't use. So scheduler doesn't really pay attention to limits at all. And the container runtime will map the limits uh, specified to memory.max, which is a file in the cgroup hierarchy. Cgroups are the way that uh, re uh, limits work in some requests as well. Um, and this is sometimes enforced by the kernel by oom killing. So if, if a container uses more than its allotted amount of memory, then it may be oom killed if the uh, kernel is feeling memory pressure. We can see a pod here as an example of uh, you know, what you know, it looks like to specify memory requests and limits. Um, so here we have uh, two containers, one of which has a limit of 64 megabytes, and then one of them is 32. And then you can see this in the C group hierarchy. So I created this pod, and this is the pod itself. And this asterisk here is just saying, show me all of the um, you know, subpaths in this pod. You can ignore this max. That's for the infra container. It's not relevant here. So you, but you can see these two values. So this 67,000 whatever, I'm not looking at the uh, decimals, that's the 64 megabytes, and then this 33 here is this 32. Um, so we can see that the uh, memory requests directly map to the C groups there. Similarly, CPU, uh, for the scheduler, the C scheduler will see the CPU limit value, uh, request value and find a node that there's enough space for that on. The CRI, the container runtime, will map the requested CPU to the CPU.wait field in the C groups. So this is a difference from memory, where it actually the uh, the kernel will actually you know enforce the request. Um, this is done with CPU wait, um, and we uh, it's uh, basically a way of uh, specifying you know it's like choosing a slice of uh, the CPU, it's like always going to be allocated that amount. So it's, it, when the um, container, uh, the pod request is like, I would like at least this much CPU weight as a way of specifying that. And you can see be, uh, the, uh, this sort of playing out. You know, you have a half of the um, request here, um, you know, 250 and 125, and this is mapped to the CPU weight of uh, 10 and 5. And the total cumulative for the pod is 15, again, ignoring the infra container, not relevant. CPU limit, um, scheduler is again going to ignore CPU limits. The container runtime maps the limits to CPU.max, um, which is specified over a period of time. So when you say, I want 125 um, per this period, it's going to be mapped directly to the kernel, again, ignoring this max. And then we have this um, 250 for uh, the CPU request and 125 roughly, and this um, 
and then there's added together to CPU.max. So what this is painting here is basically for both CPU and memory, uh, the individual container uh, requests are summed together, and that is you know, contributing to what the pod overall is going to use. Um, this is all standard. This is the way it's worked for 10 years now, and it's worked great. But as many of you as probably know, this is not a really you know, fully comprehensive solution. There are some cases that it doesn't work quite well for. Um, so, you know, for instance, when you're trying to fit cats in boxes, sometimes your cats don't fit perfectly well into the boxes that they've chosen for themselves. Um, and this happens in containers as well. So the first sort of situation that this comes up with is in multi-container pods. So imagine you have an, a development environment pod, and you have one container that's running your IDE, and one um, that's going to be you know, for debugging uh, in, and then one of them is just a language server that's going to you know, give you your extra, your fun, um, special highlighting and everything like that. Um, when you create this pod, you have to know exactly how much each of these containers are going to use and then allocate them that amount. So that uh, requires a decent amount of understanding of the workload that you're running. And uh, it's hard to predict if like, maybe these workloads don't work quite as well, like exactly as you want. There's a lot of adjustment. And this is you know, the motivation of projects like Vertical Pod Autoscaler, which will change the requests uh, and limit, or the limits that a um, pod is allocated. Another sort of similar example, but a little bit different, um, is in high burst applications. So, like, imagine you have, you know, this data preprocess, uh, this data processing pod, and it's got all of these different functions, and they're sort of passing information back and forth. And at different times, they're going to be using different amounts of memory, but they're going to spike at different times because, you know, you're going to be doing transformation at a different time maybe than you're doing cleaning. Um, and when you allocate out resources for these specifically, with, you know, with uh, requests and limits, you're saying, like, I need this at my max amount because I don't want to get killed or I don't want to get throttled. Um, but you can't really account for the way that they idle differently uh, or spike differently. So you have to sort of over allocate for each of these containers and, um, you know, have times where there's downtime and unused resources. And this is even to the point where, like, you know, there's uh, some common wisdom. Um, that says don't even use CPU limits because if you put a CPU limit in a, pot, a container and it doesn't use all of its CPU, that CPU is wasted. Basically, the kernel will not use that CPU for anything else. Uh, and this is not um, very uh, good for having our nodes being fully utilized. So, you know, this problem, uh, luckily, is we're trying to address. And I'll um, pass it over to Dixita to show how. Sure. So um, like Peter highlighted, container level resource management or trying to assess how much each container would need, specifically if you have a lot of containers in a pod, it can be a daunting task. So it reminds me of uh, Alexis from Schitt's Creek. Picture her arriving at KubeCon with, a, with an adorable cabin bag. But once she goes to the expo and she collects a lot of swag, it just doesn't fit in. So this is the problem with res uh, container level resource management. With that, she has only one option. She could utilize her limited resource, which is money, to get a bigger bag just for this one instance where the uh, suitcase is bursting, basically. But with pod level resources, she could redistribute the extra swag and find a friend whose bag is half empty, and she's traveling to the same place as her. And she could just put in her stuff there and then get it back once they have arrived at the destination. So pod level resources, with, with this feature, we are basically enabling the containers to dynamically share the unused resources within the pod. And the users will just have to specify the requests and limits for the entire pod and not worry about how much each container would need. So it's a more holistic approach to resource management. And to enable this holistic approach, we have modified the pod API. We have added the support for resources in here at the spec level where you define the, uh, the overall resource needs of your spec. And then all your containers in it, be it regular containers, init containers, sidecar containers, or ephemeral containers, all of them would have the ceiling, the boundaries of what you have specified uh, at the pod level. So how it, how it can be beneficial is it simplifies the resource management. The user just has to worry about one set of requests and limits, making the configuration really simple and not worrying about n sets of requests and limits for each n containers in their pods. It also gives the greater flexibility if there are any unused resources that are allocated to the pod, which some of the containers are not using while the others need for the amount of time they're bursting, they could just share those resources. 
It also helps with the better uh, resource utilization, which leads to some uh, cost savings, like Alexis was able to save, not buying another suitcase. So I want to highlight uh, this one example of a pod, uh, which can be now uh, which can now be uh, used with pod level resources. Say you have a pod with three containers. Um, we are just taking uh, regular containers for this example. If you do not specify container level requests, uh, Kubernetes will treat all three containers of equal priority when it comes to um killing. But if you specify requests, then the, uh, the ones with the higher requests specified will have a lower priority. So in this, in this uh, application, you don't have to worry about uh, the limits, specifying the limits for each container. You just specify a request, a top level request, uh, sorry, top level limit at the pod level. And then the containers can just burst into each other. This is a very important use case when it comes to the AI ML uh, applications, where uh, it's, I mean, the containers can burst into each other. Like, for example, a data processing pod, which uh, Peter was talking about. Say the data transformation doesn't need as much resources at a point of time, while the actual application, while the actual container that's cleaning the data at that point requires more resources. So they could just burst into each other and share those resources. Let's deep dive into the implementation details. Uh, what has essentially changed for all the Kubernetes components with this feature? Uh, from the control plane perspective, in the API server, we have added some new validation logic, which will ensure that your pod level requests are less than the limits. Your pod level requests are, le uh, are greater than or equal to your aggregated container level requests, if you specify those. But the magic happens with the pod level limits. If you specify the pod level limits, they don't necessarily have to be greater than or less than the container level limits. They can, they can still be less than the container level limits. The next change that has gone in is in the scheduler. Uh, the scheduler was previously just aggregating the container level requests to find the node that would fit the pod. But now if you specify the pod level values, it will just use those values directly. There are a lot of changes that went in the kubelet, but the main being uh, kubelet was also doing some complex calculation, trying to see if it is a sidecar container, it has some logic uh, for the calculation. With this pod level resources, it would just use the value from the pod spec and pass it on the, to the container runtimes. And the container runtimes will ensure that those values are set as the boundaries in the C groups so that your pod as a whole is using only that much resources that you have specified in the limits. Like I said, there are a lot of changes that happen in the kubelet. Some of them we made in alpha, and some of them we'll be making uh, in beta. So today, uh, in the kubelet determines the QoS classes uh, from the container level resources. But with this new feature, if you specify pod level request or limit, any of those, kubelet will consider only those values and it will discard the container level values uh, for the QoS determination logic. So QoS in uh, Kubernetes are of three types. One is guaranteed, the other one is burstable, the third one is best effort. Uh, Kubelet uses the QS classes to also determine uh, the behavior of the OOM killer. Your guaranteed and your best effort pods get sort of a constant uh, OOM score adjustment. But for the best, uh, for the burstable pods, Kubernetes does some calculation which we'll talk about. So Kubernetes uses this uh, Linux kernel's mechanism, OOM score adjust, which influences which, which influences the priority order of the processes which, uh, which will be killed by the OOM killer. So today, uh, the OOM score adjustment only takes memory request into account. So we have made sure that we adjust that and take uh, pod level memory request also into account. Because if we wouldn't have done that, then your memory request at the container level would be zero, which means the value of this formula will, would result a value of 1,000 which means all your containers in a pod that have only pod level resources with this formula would be um killed the first. So to change that, we have added uh, uh, this pod level memory request also in this formula. To understand more details, uh, I have linked the cap in the last slide. So the common questions and misconceptions that people have asked us is, why are we doing this? Like, w weren't the pod level resources just enough? Like, why, what's the main advantage? But like I highlighted in one of the previous slides, what happens is it's very difficult to gauge how much each container would need. And within a pod, it happens that 
the burst, the containers might not burst together synchronously. There are instances when one container is using the resources and then the other container is not using the resources. And to make sure that these idle resources are uh, used in an efficient manner, we, are, we, are, we have added this feature so that the idle resources can be shared dynamically amongst the containers. So the second question is, uh, does the pod level container management or the pod level spec disallow container level requests and limits? But that's not the case. These both work in tandem. You can specify both or you can specify either of these and Kubernetes takes care of uh, making sure that these values are translated to the C group values and also passed on to the other features that would need these values. The third most important question that people have asked us is, does this affect our monitoring tools? And what about the high level schedulers like Q? Well, how, how will it know uh, about this? How, it's still not aware of the pod level request, so how will it know about this new feature? So in order to uh, help these schedulers or any third party libraries that would want to know how much the pods are uh, pods will need, we have added a helper a com helper component in an external library that can be used by all these third party tools. They can query this library and this library library takes care of the logic, all the if and else, if you have container level values, do the aggregation. If you have pod level values, just spit out those values from the helper. So it, we, we have added these uh, helper methods that can be used by the external, uh, uh, external components. The last question is, is this feature supported for all resource types? Unfortunately, this is only supported for memory and CPU right now. In future, we might support it for other resources, but as of now, we are only planning to support uh, memory and CPU only. So we are very excited about this feature and the potential of this feature and all the use cases that this would unlock. This feature is going alpha in 132, most likely, still in the release phase. And we have added the minimum support, like the values from the spec are translated correctly to the C groups, that's taken care of. The scheduler uh, logic is taken care of. API server validation is also taken care of. We have also taken care of the admission controller logic, uh, the limit ranger and the resource quota. But all the complex uh, managers, topology, memory, and CPU, the support for that will come in 133. And also the support for huge pages resource type would come in 133. And we also plan to support this exciting uh, in-place pod resize feature, which is going beta in 132. We plan to support that uh, in the beta of pod level resources in 133, if we figure it out correctly, because it's a very complicated feature. And then there is this another interesting cap that is in talk in Signode community, which is dynamic containers in a pod. So this feature is still in works, and if the, it materializes, this will allow adding containers and removing containers from the pod dynamically, again for AI ML workloads. And pod level resources is the feature that enables dynamic containers in a pod. So last but not the least, uh, before we go beta in 133, we, want to get, we are trying to gather as much feedback as possible from the community around. So it would be great if you try this feature out with your existing deployments and let us know how it works. And if there, if there are any use cases that we have missed, please reach out to us. I have added the link for the cap and also the, uh, the link for the GitHub uh, community page. So please reach out to us. We have a lot of work that we want to do in the beta, like supporting all these uh, components. So it will be great if you would also help us uh, in developing this feature. And last but not the least, please drop us feedback, good or bad, using this QR code. Thank you. I just had one question. Um, how does it work at the low level about the, the C group limits? Like, I thought that, that the underlying containers wouldn't be allowed to exceed their limits. So the C group limits will be specified at the pod level. But if you specify C group limits at the container level as well, those would be set as well. And containers would individually not be able to use more than what you have set okay. at the container level. But together, like if you don't specify the limits at container level, together they can burst up to uh, the pod level limit. I'll give you an example. For example, you have a pod in which you specify pod level limit of 100, but container one has limit of 60, container two has limit of 50. 
the aggregate is more than 100, right? So together, they will never be able to use more than 100. Okay. But individually, when one container is not using the resource, they would be able to burst until their own individual limits. Right. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Question, how, can you hear me? Yes. Mm. Uh, how is the various Prometheus metrics for uh, resource requests and limits gonna, is that gonna be rolled up? Or is it going to add another metric for the pod level request? So the, the metrics uh, in Prometheus actually are coming from C Advisor, and it's scraping, I think, the majority of the C groups on the node. And so the, because the limits and requests... Oh, it's implemented the C group, so, it right. so it doesn't matter. It'll just be scraped from those C groups and then report in the same way. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I had a question on the um, pod level spec. So when you specify only pod level spec, uh, what guardrail exists for a particular container to not uh, consume all the resources? There is no guardrail preventing any one container from consuming all of the resources within the pod. The only guardrail is like the boundary of the pod. So the containers do have to do a little bit of coordination to make sure that you know some everyone's getting their fair share. And you can use you know limits and requests within the containers like as Dixita mentioned earlier, which will you know make sure that everyone gets a little bit, but not every uh, every container um, is able to use. Uh, you know you can still burst within it, and like the containers will look over provision, but from the perspective of the pod, it'll never go over the pod's limit. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, maybe this slide answers this. But I'm just curious whether init containers are constrained by or exempt from the pod level. Uh, they are also, all your containers will be constrained by the pod level limits. Although we are still trying to figure out, like for the OOM um, um score adjust calculation, right now we are dividing the pod level request equally amongst all the containers if the container level requests are not specified. But maybe we might want to change that with respect to the init containers. But to answer the resource boundaries uh, of all the containers will be guarded by the pod level values. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, just a clarification question on the previous one that was asked. So if I specify requests at the container le containers level, and then I specify just the limits at the pod level, the behavior I would get is each of my containers can is guaranteed the resources are requested, but they can burst up to the pod limit and aggregate. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So the use case where we want to allow the users to specify container level values in this case is if they care about the priority yeah. of um kill when there is a resource crunch. Hmm. But if you do not care about the priority of your containers, just don't specify the requests at the container level. But if you want to make sure that one container gets a higher priority over the other, specify either higher requests for one and a lower for the other one, or specify requests for one and no requests for the other one. I see. The main uh, use case in our case would be that we want to ensure our containers get some guaranteed amount of resources so that you don't have sidecars using more resources than the app container, for example. Uh, because if you don't specify anything at the container level, then you have a noisy neighbor problem. One caveat is that um, so that you would be able to get that behavior with CPU because CPU is, you know, the weight is being reflected in the C groups, but actually there's no guarantee with that with memory because without the memory QoS because uh, there's nothing saying in the C groups like every like this container must get at least this amount so it's a little bit more but because memory limits are a little bit more um, fuzzy anyway yeah. if you're enabling overcommit like it yeah. it could be okay but yeah you it would actually do that um, functionally uh, in uh, for uh, CPU. Okay, so for CPU, it will be guaranteed resources, but for memory, not so much if you specify yeah, the part. Okay. Exactly. Got it. And uh, last question. The topology awareness, meaning like uh, CPU pinning or uh, NUMA boundaries, they don't, uh, they're not supported yet, but there's a plan to do it in the next version, right? That's right. And we'll short circuit all the policies that work only at the container level for pod level resources. Okay, got it. Thank you. Welcome. The famous, less of a question, more of a comment. This is a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> you guys should feel proud. Thank you. Thank you. Question, uh, the CPU limit, bad practice that you shared before, 
Uh, is the same at pod level as the container limit? Or this new feature removes that bad practice? This, this one? Yeah. Uh, sorry, what was the question? Yeah, um, the uh, CPU limit, bad practice that you share at the beginning, mm -hmm. that you should not uh, specify CPU limit, uh, is the same in this new feature, or it r removes that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I don't know, uh, probably, because still there. So theoretically, this will help mitigate it for inter-container within a pod issue. So like containers within that pod would still be able to sort of like help them reach the limit. But there will always be sort of a ceiling that a process will be able to use the CPU wise. And so like if you're not careful with the way that you set your limits and making sure that your processes are always going to use them, then you're still going to hit that risk. But it does sort of mitigate it in the sense that like there is a backup. There's a fallback that could be potentially used, but um, it's not perfect. And so I think a lot of people will end up still not using them. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great talk. Uh, I think uh, if I understand correctly, this is to well going to help uh, when the pod has many containers. Uh, going to consolidate, then you can set pod level resource. But then you still have the problem how to figure out and set the proper pod level CPU and memory request limit. That will still be very challenging in practice. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, you're right. The, we, we haven't solved the whole process. But the idea is that, uh, you know, the average of the, like, you're reducing the risk, like, because the scope is larger. So you're, it's easier to sort of, it's like a larger target to hit, right? Like, you know, you have more sort of a leeway within that um, pod because there's multiple processes to, like, you know, use the resources. So theoretically, it should be a little bit easier to, um, to you know, find a, an amount that works. Yeah, I agree it will be a little bit easier. Uh, I just wondering whether in, uh, in SIG node, is there a roadmap or plan to help the developer to set it? Well, VPA would be the in-place resizing would be then the next logical step. I mean, and, and that's already, that's ahead of this kept as being beta. So, I mean, that I would say, then you have a way you know, you could use different controllers to actually ask, hey, this pod is actually not using enough. We need to sort of, um, we need to reduce its limits or vice versa um, to help right size. So that's that's the sort of, that would be the uh, SIG's recommendation. Got it, thank you. Um, I had a couple questions. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, a little bit closer. The, the mics are a little bit quiet. Okay, I have a couple questions. Um, my first question, and maybe I just missed it, um, if you specify requests at both the pod level and for every container, and the container requests sum to higher than the pod level requests, how does the scheduler handle that case? Or is that not even allowed? That's not allowed. Okay. The requests at the, con the aggregate of the requests at the container level have to be less than what's specified at the pod level. Okay, thanks. Um, and I'm assuming we would just take the higher one. Okay, or the, the pod level, okay. Um, and then my second question, so you guys mentioned that, um, you know, this is particularly effective for like ML workloads. Um, are there any workloads that you see this maybe not being effective for? I'm curious. Single container pods. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, if you already right-sized your applications, then I mean, like, what's the point? You've already, you know. But, um, you know, your guaranteed pods, if you've already, like, yeah, correctly figured it out, then keep it up. Um, and also, you know, a VPA case could maybe lower the, uh, the, um, the amount that you can get from it because, you know, if, if uh, the autoscaler is right-sizing it, then, like, maybe it's not, it, maybe it'd be better just to keep it right-sized than having this buffer. But, um, yeah, I don't think any particular uh, workload. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, I I was thinking one of the weirdness with the current limits is like I understand the Oom killer comes out of Linux. It's basically killing something to try to free stuff up, right? Um, is there any thought because we're putting pod limits of causing the Oom instead of just killing the one container, maybe taking the pod out, right? So it can then be rescheduled because that's I've seen systems where you know, a container keeps crashing and crashing, but the pod gets stuck because everything else around it, so. 
Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, uh, we're actually, you know, scheming on a world where um, we integrate PSI metrics, um, which the kernel will use to sort of like emit to say like, you know, these uh, processes have been waiting for this specific resource for this amount of time. And the idea is like you could have integrations with something like a descheduler or something like, you know, there, there's all of these different ways or like smarter eviction, things like that to have, you know, we can see the granularity in the um, containers and the pod levels of like, okay, these are really waiting for a lot of memory. Maybe we should free some stuff up. And then like other controllers outside of, you know, maybe in tree can um, react to that. Hi, thanks for the talk. So uh, I see that the kubelet is passing down these pod resources now to the container runtime. So my question is that in the case that these spot level resources are not defined, is there any change in the current communication towards container runtime? Or are, so are you filling, filling this up in the case of they are missing? Yeah, um, I think the idea is going to be, um, and this will come in beta, um, like with the, there's the cap for the pass down the resources, the CRI piece. And I think that the idea is there'll be, you know, a, a um, Basically, the qubit will tell the CRI, like, I chose this for the pod level, um, you know, requests and limits, just so you know. Um, and then the CRI could sort of take that into account um, and pass it down to, you know, a Kata or someone else to actually, you know, right size the VM that's being created. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, another. This probably wouldn't make sense for an initial thing, but uh, what do you think uh, the impact might be if an inferred value of this was chosen? Say, the sum of all the containers requests or in the sum of all the limits were used automatically. Um, are you suggesting that we do that or are you wondering the consequences? I'm wondering the consequences. That? Um, I mean, that's basically like setting the, um, that's basically like setting the limits in the container itself, you know, just like a more automated process. This gives us a little bit more flexibility to actually not have, you know, limits or requests within the contain on the container granularity. So, I mean, it like could do that, but you could also pretty easily have like some admission controller to do that for you. Um, and just, or like, you know, a mutating webhook to change like, oh, I see that it's a pod limit. Let's just divide it among all the containers. But that also wouldn't really help for, you know, some more dynamic cases also. So, I mean, I think the, we currently have that just less automated. So having it, this not work that way would provides like net new behavior. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy KubeCon.